so cute, the Melbourne audience. Good evening, I'm Tony Jones. Welcome to Q&A live from Melbourne, here to answer your questions. Former Senator for Palmer United, the Jackie Lambie Network, and Tasmania, Jackie Lambie. The Minister for Social Services, Dan Tien. Author and broadcaster, Rosie Waterland. Workplace Relations Commentator and Consultant, Grace Collier. And Shadow Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Now, Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio, but not at this time on News 24. Well, we'll get to the One Nation implosion, political performers on TV and making ends meet soon enough. But our first question tonight comes from Gregory Storer. Thanks, Tony. Dan, I've got a question for you. I grew up in uh, the electorate of Wannan in Hamilton and moved away from Hamilton in my mid-30s. Um, to live in, in Melbourne. I'm a country lad at heart, still love Hamilton, and I have a close connection to uh, the Western District. One of my reasons for leaving the country was homophobia. I know of people in places like Tarang, Cavendish, MacArthur, Dunkeld, Hamilton and Warrnambool who tell me that they're still not out. And uh, we know that farmers generally are under tremendous pressure leading to mental health issues. And some of my friends, their sexuality and their gender issues on top of that can push them over the edge. Uh, plenty of more conservative forces are still working to thwart equality in the bush. What are you doing as a rural leader to challenge homophobia in Wannan and in your own party? Go ahead, Dan. Thanks, Tony, and thanks for your, your question. Well, what I'm doing is making sure that I'm representing every member of my community to the best of my ability. Uh, I meet with groups of young people who raise this, these issues with me. Uh, I encourage them to make sure they want to be who they are and that they're not afraid to be who they are. I continually engage with them. Uh, if they come to see me, I want to take the time, hear what they've got to say, deal with their issues and make sure that they won't confront those issues going forward. Uh, it is a, an important issue and one of the important issues that I'll continue to work on as, as the member for one and as, and as a member of the government. So, Dan, uh, you're aware of people leading secret lives because they're afraid of homophobia or people even fleeing the bush because of that? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say I'm aware of people fleeing the bush because of it, but I've had groups come and see to me to talk about this issue and to talk about the problems that they've had and to ask whether um, you know, the government can make sure that the policies that are in place mean that they, they can live the life to the best of their ability. And I'll continue to engage with those groups and to continue to work with them to make sure that they can. Let's just quickly go back to uh, Gregory, our question. Before we hear from the other uh, panellists, just tell us what it's like to experience homophobia in your hometown. Oh, it looked pretty horrible and it took me years and years to actually get over that and to find a, a good and happy relationship to be in and feel confident and here I am on Q&A asking questions which is not something I would have ever been able to do for living in Hamilton. Uh, but, but Dan, I, I guess the big question then is, is to walk the talk for me is to uh, see you with the Pride match coming up in a couple of weeks and, uh, and, and to mix it with the crowd. I mean one of the big challenges of being in the country is going to a country footy match. And, uh, and, and being there with, with the locals and uh, we was, I was there last year and I didn't see you there. It would be great to have your support this year to be able to, to shake hands and to say, you know, here I am. Well, there's a, a, you've just mentioned a wonderful example. That, that match has now been going on for a couple of years now. Second. A, and the, the town uh, as well got right behind it and put posters in all the shop fronts and everything. Uh, I was away uh, last year when the match was on. I'm not quite sure uh, what I'm doing that weekend. I'll, I'll have a look in my diary. But I was at the local football only two Saturday nights ago watching the local game and the Football club has done a wonderful job in this area, as have many sporting clubs across Western Victoria. And if, if I can get there, I'll be there. But um, I'm not quite sure whether, whether I am home that weekend or not. But uh, I, I if I am, I'll look, forward to, uh, <laughs> I'll look forward to seeing I'll you there. You. Yes, no, please yeah. do. Please I, do. I think you should definitely get there. Yeah, I'll just have to have a look and see uh, what other commitments I've got. I'd love to be able to say... Give me your diary yes, and a Sharpie uh, and I will... I, I will. <laughs> I've got a funny feeling I might be in Sejuna, but anyway, I'll check and if I can be there, I will be yeah, you there. You could dust off your Rambo T-shirt. 
Yes, no, happy to uh, happy to dust off the rainbow oh. T-shirt if that keeps you happy, Tony. <laughs> well, I'm not yes. saying it'll keep me happy, but yes. maybe other people. Uh, Jackie, um, Tasmania, similar problems? Yeah, there is, unfortunately. Um, obviously, Hobart's very open to this sort of stuff. The city dwellers, you're right, and outside of Hobart, the rural and regional area is very conservative. Um, and that's just really unfortunate. They are getting better, but we, um, we don't see a lot of people out there, a lot of the gay community out there on show either, so that's making it a little bit more difficult. I haven't heard of it. I'm in rural and regional area of Tasmania, obviously, and I haven't had any gay people coming up to telling me that they're having issues down there, So, but I'm not seeing them out in the streets either, which is really unfortunate. I'm sure they'll get there and they'll catch up to the city dwellers. Um, and we'll have to wait for that. But it's really brave of you to come forward. And like you said, you've had to work your way up to ask that question. And because of that, there'll be others that'll follow. So thank you for that. Rosie. Um, look, I'm bisexual. I um, only admitted to that a couple of years ago. Um, I grew up in the inner city from the time I was about 17. I went to drama school, um, so I had, uh, you know, absolutely no problem in my life with ever having to admit something like that, and it was even difficult for me. I'm 32 now. I didn't say anything about it until I was um, 30. Um, so I can't imagine how difficult it would be to grow up in a rural community, and the fact that, and the fact that you came here tonight and Mr. Tien on the spot, to be honest, and asked him to go to that game. And I'll tell you what, I'll be checking if you're there. <laughs> that is hugely courageous of you. Um, I applaud you for it. Grace, what do you reckon? Well, I mean, it's, it's always... I'm, I'm sorry that you've experienced, um, you know, ignorance and discrimination and... It's something that happens all the time. I don't think it's just um, in the country areas. I have a very good friend of mine who was bashed right in the middle of Sydney for walking down the street just holding hands with his boyfriend, um, just jumped on from behind. So, I, I, I mean, I do... I understand it's worse, but I can only offer you my support and say thank you for coming out and speaking because that's really all it takes. All it takes is for people to stand up and say, well, hello, this is me, and um, you shine a light there for everyone to follow. Mark, is there a role for governments here? And we talk about local members going to footy matches and so on, that's good, um, in terms of seeing who's in your constituency, but what about a broader issue? Uh, too right there is. I'm sorry you've had to grow up anywhere in Australia where you've grown up uh, enduring homophobia, and good on you for asking this question tonight, but... I think we've got a lot of unfinished business still, even though Australia achieved marriage equality last year. And what I'm worrying about, and this is the government question, Tony, um, is the pushback that we've seen. It did occur in the United States, did occur in the United Kingdom. We're going to see a pushback here in Australia against the achievement of marriage equality and attempt to delegitimise it. Um, that's the role for government, to make sure that that delegitimisation does not happen and to hang on to the achievement that we made with marriage equality and to keep on uh, dealing with the unfinished business. I'll just quickly throw that to Dan before we move on. Uh, do you think there is going to be a role um, for government to make sure there isn't a kind of kickback from the community that, or the part of the community that lost in that vote? Well, I've seen no sign of a, a, a kickback. As a matter of fact, I, I, what I saw was acceptance and a, an ability to, to move on. So, I, I mean, I've seen no sign of that. Uh, I would say, just going back um, to the question, when you, when you do go, I don't know whether, the, whether it will be under lights or whether it's during the day, but if it's under lights... I help get those lights for the Hamilton Football Club, <laughs> so uh, you can you can give me a little bit of applause for that. Yeah, it's all politics. It, 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 it is. It is. All right, let's move along. The next question is from Louise Kenny. Yep. Thanks, Tony. Um, in light of the issues that have even arisen with One Nation's Brian Burston this week and Ms. Lambie herself splitting from Clive Palmer United, um, a lot of voters could be left feeling that the vote that they gave on a specific platform has been manipulated to represent something that they didn't choose when politicians do move to a different party or become an independent from a party after they've been elected. So my question is, should there be restrictions on elected MPs from moving either from an independent platform to affiliation with a party 
or vice versa, leaving a party once they've been elected. Jackie, um, I'll go to you first, obviously, because um, you've done it yourself and you've had it done to you. Yeah, so, um, look, it is really difficult being micro-parties and independents out there. There's no doubt about that. What You don't think that these guys aren't fighting with each other behind closed doors because they are. We're going to be hit because we're a lot smaller to hit and uh, that's the truth of the matter. Absolutely not. You, if politicians actually did what they were supposed to instead of putting their party first and putting their state first, then... Uh, we wouldn't be having this issue. There is nothing wrong with, with um, crossing the floor. If Senator Burston thought it was better for New South Wales to have the business cuts put through, then that's who he has to vote for, not for Pauline Hanson. So I think this is, this is where we're getting to. So, um, look, I had a choice. I had a state team running out there and Steve Martin was becoming baggage, so I got rid of him. It was that simple because it was dragging my state team down. That was very early on. That was no good for me, nor it was no good for the network, and we're a big on mateship, so he had a choice there and he didn't use that. So um, I would say this to Pauline Hanson when she wakes up in the morning, though. Um, stop the tap from dripping and either kiss and make up or sack him and get on with it, honestly, because we need to get on with what, what matters in this country. And while you've got this and Barnaby Joyce going on, you know, we really, we're not getting to the crux of what politically needs to be done in this country. And there's a lot of economic stuff that is coming up and be coming up in the budget. We need to be watching it very carefully and we shouldn't be distracted with this sort of thing. So clean up your mess, George, as quickly as possible and move on. But move on. Yeah, Jackie, uh, I suspect Pauline Hanson would say this is all about the economic stuff, actually, because she wants to vote against those uh, corporate tax cuts. Yeah, and, but uh, see, Brian Burston, who's in her party, basically defected on that issue. Yeah, while she's trying to, you, while she's trying to sell that message, though, it's now getting distracted, distracted because this is now taking over the message she's trying to sell. Nobody's winning out of this. So let's just get on with it. If, if you can't kiss and make up, then move on. But get on representing your bloody state. That's what you voted in for, not to represent your party. Last I checked. But we seem to get it very wrong in this country. One of the only countries left in Western civilisation that when someone from the same party crosses the floor, it's like, oh, my God! It's not that bad, you know? That's democracy, isn't it? It's not that bad, but you think she should sack him? No, well, she should just kiss and make up and say, well, you're going one way, I'm voting over here, yeah. that's fine. And I've seen Clive Palmer do it, Tony, you know? That's why when I refused, said, no, it's not going to work for Tasmania, he made the other two senators cross the floor and vote with me because he couldn't bear the thought mm. of us being separated. It's the 21st century. It's a democracy. If your state does not fit into what New South Wales is, and I can tell you what, Tasmania and South Australia are more like brother and sister, not New South Wales that's got all the cash. So what's going to suit New South Wales will not suit Tasmania, I can tell you now. So that makes it very difficult. How can I make somebody that belongs to me to vote for me if it doesn't suit their state? How is that supposed to keep them in their seat? Rosie, what did you make of uh, Pauline Hanson's tears? And does it look like uh, what we've seen before, which is one nation splintering and finally disappearing? Yeah, look, she's... Uh, Pauline Hanson has been pretty prominent across the political landscape since I was a little kid. I've grown up watching her. Um, and I get the sense now that it's been a few decades. Maybe politics just isn't her jam. Like, <laughs> it just never really seems to work out for her. She doesn't seem to be good at the backdoor dealing part of things. She doesn't seem to be good at the policy side of things. Like, maybe it's just time to change direction, go to TAFE, learn a trade. I don't know. <laughs> We have a non-politician, Grace. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, we saw it was a pretty extraordinary moment. Pauline Hanson bursting into tears, and if you see this video. Hmm. So, which question are you wanting me to answer? Well, you always uh, saw the one. You from can the you audience. can answer you can answer both of them because that was mentioned within that question yeah. as well. Okay. So, the, as to the question from the audience member, I understand where you're coming from, but I think we need to allow people to change. Unfortunately, even if that means being disappointed, um, that's life. Disappointment is part of life. Uh, and as Jackie says, it's democracy. As, as to uh, the questions on Pauline, um, look, quite frankly, I admire anybody that get, gets themselves into Parliament. Um, I, it's difficult. Um, there's a lot of sacrifice and um, it can destroy your life. And uh, I think so. I have a lot of admiration for Pauline. She's been to jail. She's uh, really been through it. And she's still there. She's still plugging away. And Jackie, 
she's been there, she's, she's out now, she's trying to get back in. I've got nothing but admiration for Jackie either. Uh, it doesn't mean I agree with everything that Pauline says or everything that Jackie says, but if you can get yourself there and you can be there and you can do what you believe in doing, then good on you. Dan Tian. Uh, well, I, I think it's a, it's a good question and it boils down to a, a question of integrity. If you go before the Australian people and say that you're standing for election and you're standing for this party, then my view, you have a real commitment to live by what you've said. Now, if you don't, then you need to explain your reasons very clearly why you haven't. And then it's obviously going to be up to the voters then to determine whether those reasons were adequate or, no, or not. But you do make a commitment when you stand before the Australian people and say, I'm going to represent this party or that party. And I think, to the best of your ability, you, you should try and honour that commitment. So, Dan, do you think those defectors that you've drawn into the coalition, um, quite happily, it seemed, uh, somehow tainted? Uh, I think what they need to be able to do is explain their reasons for why they took that course of action. They need to be able to explain that to the people who voted for them. And in the end, that, that explanation will determine down the track whether they should get uh, elected again. But I think what you say to the people when you stand to represent them, you should, to the best of your ability, try and honour that. Mark. Well, the Liberal Party were quite happy to take in Lucy Gachui, who was elected as a Family First Senator, and quite happy to take in Steve Martin, who I think was elected on your ticket. Uh, Jackie, and he's they now like in the They like to pick up the scraps, you know that. They <laughs> like to pick up the scraps. <laughs> he, he, he's now in the One Nation Party. Um, Louisa's question goes to quite a difficult point, which is um, people get elected on a party ticket, including my, these micro-party tickets. Uh, the Constitution says that if they leave, they get replaced... Um, by someone from their party. But if they leave their party and stay, the Constitution doesn't tell us anything about this. Uh, the one thing that's clear to me is that uh, certainly One Nation has been an absolute circus. And I am certain that very many of the parliamentarians elected on the One Nation ticket in the last 20 years, including the three out of the four that have been elected uh, in the last federal election, have massively disappointed the people they voted for. And if, if I could offer this thought, I, I look for what politicians do rather than what they say. And what One Nation has done since the four senators were elected in 2016 is to vote 90 per cent of the time with the Liberal Party. And that's a really important thing. You could be forgiven for thinking otherwise if you listen to various One Nation politicians. So you're saying they're offering us up stability? Well, they didn't go to the people and say, we are going to vote with the Liberal Party 90% of the time. They offered some other message, uh, pretty policy-free, I'd have to say. Uh, and I'm hoping that people who are thinking about voting for One Nation again uh, keep in mind that since 2016, what One Nation's representatives in the Australian Parliament have done is vote 90% of the time with the government. All right, let's move on. We've got a lot of questions to get through tonight. This one's from Julia Irwin. I'd like to know whether um, today's politicians, especially those from minor parties, are too ego-driven and self-serving to actually serve their constituents and actually get some sort of action for their constituents. I'm saying this after the $150,000 Barnaby Joyce interview in which he failed to answer most questions and um, then said he didn't give a shit about the ramifications, the political ramifications. And, I mean, even major, the major parties... Um, you know, we've got more, more than 50% own investment properties, more than 50% of the, of the politicians in the major parties own investment proper, uh, properties, including the two that we've got on We tonight. might try, just for, to, to prevent confusion, we might stick with your first question, yeah, so, uh, Julie. But, but both of them. We'll come back to you, though, if you, wanna, if, if you yeah, want to come back into the equation. The you can do that during the discussion. Yeah. Uh, Rosie, what do you think? I presume you saw that interview. Yes. <laughs> um... Yeah, I think you're right. I think um, egos are a huge problem um, in politics. Um, I think it's a real problem when uh, the stories being reported on politicians could just as easily be reported in tabloids. 
I mean, I love me a bit of gossip. I'm on the gossip sites all the time. I don't want to be reading about my elected representatives next to where I read about the Kardashians. That's where it gets a bit icky, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, that interview was... Do you, yeah, do you think that's why... So, well, it was expected that maybe two million people would watch that and uh, it's vast. And the ratings that, weren't the, it's, not it's, good. It's, it's been seen as a ratings flop, actually. Yeah. Think people are just sick of it. Well, look, I only watched it because I knew I was coming on here tonight. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really want to watch it. Well, I'm glad um, you've done your homework, Rosie. That's good. Um, yeah, I think, people, I think people are tuning out because they don't want to know. They just, like Jackie said, they just want you to do your bloody job. Get to work and do what you're meant to be doing. Grace, what do you reckon? Um, it's a very good question. Uh, from what I've observed, um, Tony didn't mention it before, but I have a column with... Am I allowed to say the name? You are. I, I, I have a column with the Australian newspaper. <gasps> and... <laughs> <laughs> yes. We have people with columns on the Australian regularly on the this American, channel. The American, not please, the Australian. Please don't try and look like you're special. <laughs> so... Um, so as a result of the column, I do have a, um, I do have a association with politicians and generally if I ring their office, they ring me back and speak to me and so on and so forth and I do sort of bump into them here and there. And what I have observed is they are a bit like rock stars in a way. They have an entourage, they get driven around, they don't have to buy their own cars, they don't have to put petrol in it, they don't have to pay Red Joe, um, they don't have... In, to worry about insurance, they just there's somebody waiting to drive them here and drive them there. They generally go to places. People they walk in, people hand them drinks. I mean, it's 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 an amazing life. I'm sure it's very difficult as well because they're away a lot. But there is that whole um, treatment that, and if you look at what they spend, people who spend two hundred thousand a year on travel. And this is quite common. You have to be a billionaire in in the real world. You have to be a billionaire to to splash that sort of cash on travel. And so, in in a lot of respects, they are living the lives that they could never ordinarily live. And they are living the lives of um, rock stars and extreme privilege. And I think that separates them from us, and it does them a disservice. I know that they do it for convenience, but they should abolish the com car situation and they should have to catch Ubers and buy their own cars and so on and so forth because um, I'm sure that if politicians had to buy their own cars, we, w we still wouldn't have a tariff on imported vehicles because there is no reason for us to be having that tariff there. It should not be there. It's a disgrace. We don't have a car industry to support anymore and our cars are far too expensive. Our petrol is far too expensive. Our regos, our insurance, it's far too expensive and it's expensive because of the cost of government and the cost of taxes. And if our politicians had to pay some of those costs, they might be a bit more motivated to reducing those costs and making life a bit easier for the rest of us. Jackie... <laughs> Jackie, let's hear uh, from you, and I, look, I imagine you watched uh, the interview. Barnaby Joyce, well, reflecting on what Grace was just saying, Barnaby Joyce was meant to be, um, or modelled himself on a kind of man of the people. And he has he completely lost touch with what look, people I, think? I've got to be honest with you, I feel really, really sorry for the Australian people. The Sunday night before they had me on, and then they had another, they had a double debacle in a row, then they had Barnaby. I mean, how much of us do you want on there? <laughs> So, look, I, my, I'm going to be very brutally honest, and I have been about this all the way through. I am worried about this is beyond a midlife crisis. This is not but the Barnaby Joyce I know. I am concerned about his mental welfare, to be honest. I'm not going to sit here and, and kick him while he's down and out. I'll be, I'll be brutally honest with you there. Uh, my heart is going out for Barnaby. My heart's going out to both of them because they're just not dealing with this very, very well. And unfortunately, when you're in politics, if you haven't got someone on the outside that's giving you a boot up the rear end every now and then, you're stuck in your little bubble, you know, with your entourage, with your entourage. <laughs> Except for those who are unimportant and back into cattle class, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> But, um, you know, uh, it is very difficult. You know, I don't find him as his excuse to say, well, we're away from home a lot, um, you know, as an excuse for what he did, because I know soldiers and sailors and airmen are out there that have done their fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh tour that have been away for their wives most of five or six, ten years. You know, so if you can't keep it in your pants, then you're going to pay the price. It's as simple as that, and he's now <laughs> paying the price for that. Down to him. You can catch a clean, darling. <laughs> 
I don't quite know where to go from there. Um, but uh, what, what I would say to Grace is I've, I've never felt like a rock star. And um, I, what I'll be doing tomorrow is I'll be getting up at 6.30 in the morning. I'll be getting in the car. And it is provided to me while I have this job. And uh, I'll be driving to Maryborough. And I'll spend a day there, and then I'll drive myself back to Hamilton. I'll do probably three and a half, four hours driving tomorrow. I'll probably do a similar amount the day after, and I'll do it all, all myself. Or I'll have some of my staff members with me, and they'll share the driving with me. Um, I think good, good members of Parliament do try and stay grounded. It's why I was at the, the football three Saturday nights ago at Hamilton under the lights watching Hamilton play camp. The lights you paid um, I think that, well, we, um, we were able to help the community uh, and the community helped themselves and raised money for that as well. So it was just supporting the local community. So I, I think, you know, good members of parliament do try and stay grounded. I know my kids keep me absolutely grounded. They, if they thought that I was a rock star, I tell you, they would give me, give me what for. So um, I think it depends on, on the individual. Uh, I also think that, you know, what we do need to get on and do as members of parliament is say to the Australian people, we are focused on you and we are focused on delivering for you. And, you know, there was a really good example of it uh, last week with the National Redress Scheme and what was achieved there. We'll talk about that. We've got a oh, question but, specifically uh, on it. So I will, let's, but not, I, let's not but, canvas that no, right now. But I'll just say, and look, that was... Both sides of Parliament, both sides of politics working together, state and territory and Commonwealth working together, delivering for people and in a meaningful way. We'll and come, and we'll, we can do that. Down, we'll come back to that. <coughs> Pardon me, Mark Dreyfus. Uh, maybe address the actual question. Yeah, very quickly, it was a really good question, Julia. Um, and, of course, politicians have egos. I have never met a politician who did not have an ego and some of them very sizeable ones. But we ought to be conscious of that and have more policy and less personality. Uh, that's what we actually should be after in politics. Uh, speaking for myself, I went into politics to do policy. I don't do the personality attacks particularly well, or nor do I do it, if I can avoid it. Uh, and we've got far too much of it. Uh, I wish we didn't. So that's my short answer to your question. A bit more awareness of the fact that politicians have all got egos. You need to have one to go into this, just for a bit of self-protection. Uh, but we should do more policy and less personality. Let's move on to a different subject. The uh, next question is from Chrissy Stone. Hi, Tony. Politics, as reported in the media, currently seems to be about either party infighting or controversy management. This is demonstrated by the recent subpoena to Michaelia Cash and the ensuing media airtime and speculation. Should our senior political leaders do more to ensure politicians and staffers are clearly held accountable for their actions? Grace Collier. Ah, oh, I knew that would come to me. <laughs> um, so, well, yes, they should. I think that the situation that we've had with the AWU is, is disappointing. I'm disappointed in the way that a lot of the media has reported it. The focus is all on um, a tip-off about a raid or who knew who tipped off the media about the raid. The focus is not really on why was the raid being done in the first place and what, what's it about. And I think that's, that's important. It's, um, there, there's an investigation and there was a raid and those, that investigation is for a reason. It's to do with union members' money. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's what we need to well, focus on. It's to on. do with a specific donation made yeah. by the AWU to get up um, that's right. during the time when Bill Shorten mm. had... And unfortunately, and look, all unions are different. And if look, one union is very different from another union in the same way that all businesses are different, all unions are different. So you can't lump them all into the same uh, category. But generally speaking, when you're a union official, you have access to an enormous amount of cash um, and you can pretty much spend that how you wish. And that's what this issue is about. Um, in, in the past and probably still now, union officials in some unions have treated the members' money as their own personal funds. It not, hasn't been in their bank account, but they've controlled it. And you don't need to have millions of dollars in your bank account. It doesn't need to be in your personal bank account. It just needs, you just need to be the one that says how it's spent to get the benefit. 
Well, Grace, That's speaking of cash, about. what about Michaelia Cash and her refusal to accept that <laughs> subpoena? Is that the right thing for her to do, just to sort of say, I'm not going to go to a court and explain what actually happened in relation to this tip-off? Tony, it's a good question. I don't understand the legalities of it. I think, I think, the, I think probably the best thing to do is to just front up and... That, that's probably would be the way she that should, I would she handle front it. Up. Well, I mean, that would be the way that I would handle it. I've, I've all my life, I've fronted up. I've gone to the federal court and represented myself. Mm. I've represented myself in the commission. I've represented clients in the commission. I think it's always best to just go there and say I've, I'm here because I have respect for the court and respect for the process. Okay, Mark Dreyfus. Well, at least we got to Senator Cash, which I think is what your question was about. Uh, Senator Cash won't front up in Senate estimates to answer questions and won't front up in a court to answer questions. And there are really hard questions to be answered. Uh, it's an extraordinary state of affairs that Senator Cash, um, whose office have admitted engaging in criminal conduct in arranging for TV crews, the media, to be present when the Australian Federal Police were executing search warrants on a union office in Melbourne and Sydney. Simultaneously, it was pretty well arranged. Uh, Senator Cash's office has admitted being involved in that activity. Well, we should and be very precise about this, yes. because, in fact, one staffer, yes. David mm. DeGarris, has yes. actually accepted responsibility for mm. tipping off the media, and he's resigned. And he's resigned. Should that be the end of it? Mm. Uh, no, because no. the Australian Workers' Union, with some justification are pursuing the government in court and pursuing the registered organisations commission in court saying that the whole investigation is for an improper purpose it's an entirely politically motivated witch hunt that is actually directed at my leader bill shorten for an event that occurred 13 years ago a public donation by the awu to get up which was endorsed by all of the members, which was put in the AWU's newsletter. It's about as ridiculous a, a misuse of taxpayers' funds as I've ever seen. So far, Senator Cash has spent $600,000 of taxpayers' money resisting this court case. She won't do her job. She won't go into Senate estimates to answer the questions. She's not prepared to go to court. And there really have to be questions about why she's still there as a minister. Well, let's hear from before it's we go to the other... It's a pretty extraordinary state of affairs. Before we go to the other panellists... OK, hang on. Now, we need to hear if the other panellists talk, uh, audience. Thanks very much. Dan Tien, um, is this against the very notion of transparency to actually refuse to answer questions and then to say, I'm not even going to accept a court subpoena? No, well, the um, court subpoena has come via the AWU and you're able to contest the court subpoena and that's what the Senator is doing. Th this is one of the great smokescreens of all time. I've got to hand it to the AWU. Um, the, what, what we're after was whether there's any documented records of the 100,000 donation that was made to get up or the 25,000 dollar donation which was made to, to Bill Shorten's election campaign, whether they went through proper processes and there's documentation to back that. Now, this matter could be put to an end if they tabled those documents and said, here they are, but they won't. So instead, there's a big smoke screen. We'll go after Michaelia Cash. She's done nothing wrong. No one can prove that she's done anything wrong. This is a huge smoke screen to distract from Bill Shorten and the $100,000 payment that was made to get up and to his election campaign. Jackie Lambie. Why don't we just talk about politicians that are untouchable with egos? Because, honestly, if she has nothing to hide, why doesn't she answer the question in estimates? And why doesn't she go... <laughs> if she respects the court so much, because she's supposed to be a lawyer in training or a, a lawyer in practice then why isn't she getting up there on the stand to say how innocent she is? What's stopping her from doing that? Wouldn't this make this all go away? There's been nothing but a witch hunt on the union since that Royal Commission was brought on. I can tell you now because I argy-barged with the Royal Commissioner at the time in bringing Nigel Haskus to the stand. He never did that once. The man that had all the information and apparently all the evidence was never brought to the stand once during that Royal Commission. And this has been a witch hunt. And now for $600,000 that she spent to go after 100000 for Bill Shorten, what a joke this has been. I think it's about, McCallie, about time McCallie went to the back bench like her mate Barnaby. I haven't, there's no other choice here. It's time she stepped down. Do you know she's been promoted? She got all that early. She's been through the government. She's buggered this up and she needs to stand down and admit that. 
I'm just going to quickly, uh, Jackie, I'm just going to go quickly back to a uh, questioner who had a hand up, Chrissy Stone. Yeah, um, my question was about the leadership um, more so. So, yes, there's absolutely that issue. There's the Barnaby, Barnaby Joyce issue and the like. But we have senior political leaders who are managers, leaders of not only their parties but our country. Isn't it time they stood up and said and either stood for or stood against clearly these type of actions? Yep. Just, just to clarify your point, are you saying the leaders, for example, the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, should instruct his minister to answer the questions? Yes, I am. Uh, Dan. Well, the, the Prime Minister's been very clear that Michaelia Cash has the right to, uh, when it comes to the subpoena, to, compess, to contest the subpoena. Uh, there, is, there is nothing wrong with her, her doing that. Uh, I mean, the, and he's been very clear in pointing out that um, you know, the questions that need to be answered in the smokescreen here is about the AWU payments. Um, he is showing outstanding leadership on this issue. He's supporting his minister, who has done nothing wrong, and he's putting the questioning back where it needs to belong. Rosie, how does this look to you? <laughs> look, I think uh, <coughs> when you were giving interviews that, to be honest, reminded me of an Iannucci political satire, that is how ridiculously questions were being avoided being answered. It is time for your boss to rein you in and to say, look, you're not on an episode of Veep. If you've got nothing to hide, just answer the question. I, I think the biggest problem with politics is there's no disciplinary action. So if your ministers step out, they say, don't worry about that, we'll just push that under the carpet. Same thing's going on in the military, by the way. This is the leaders of today, because there is no leadership in this country. And that's where we're at, and that's the truth of the matter. It's not under the carpet, it's behind a whiteboard. Oh, it's behind a whiteboard. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> but, but, Tony, I've got to say here, because uh, I think we're forgetting, Michaelia Cash did a press conference last week, full press <coughs> conference. All the media were there. They could ask any questions that they like. And she, she didn't, she didn't, fronted didn't up. answer any of them. She did. <laughs> she fronted up. She answered all, all the questions with a, with a national press conference. Her okay. and Barnaby using the same method. I know what's going on with these questions. Now, remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. <laughs> Keep an eye on the RMIT. This is not specifically designed for that answer, so this is something we do through every program. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the details. The next question comes from Hamza Wario. Uh, the recent decision by the Fair Work Commission to grant a 3.5% wage increase would be welcome news for many people struggling to make end meet. But there is increasing evidence that low paid workers across a range of industry are being underpaid or receiving cash in hand without basic entitlement like supernation. This has a particular impact on migrant communities, including my community. How can this illegal practice be so widespread and what can be done to ensure that workers on low income are not exploited by greedy employers? Grace Collier. Hmm. It's a very good question. Um, there is a body called the Fair Work Ombudsman. It's a government body. It's there. Uh, you can make an anonymous complaint to them, um, phone in, internet. They, can, they will come and investigate and um, take action against employers. I understand that there's been more funding allocated to the Fair Work Ombudsman recently. Uh, for, for a long time there, there wasn't enough, enough people on the ground. I'm sure that they don't... I'm sure that they could always do with more funding, though, um, and I'm sure that they probably have a bigger, bigger workload. So one of, the, you know, one of the issues that I have found uh, is that if a... Firm is in the, if a firm is in the media, if there's a media campaign about underpayment, then the Fair Work Ombudsman will spend a lot of time looking into it and rectifying it. And if there isn't, if there's no media interest, then they tend to fall through the cracks. Oh. So I think that is something that... So you're saying the, this commission operates almost entirely on what's in the media? I think that I think they have a very... Well, I mean, I, yes. That suggests something's going not, badly not, wrong, doesn't it? <clears throat> I mean, it <clears throat> might actually go to our questioner's point, is what can be done to make sure that workers aren't exploited by, he says, greedy 
employers, but if the Commissioner is only looking at what's in the newspapers, that's not going to help, is it? Well, I think that they're very media sensitive from, what, from, from the dealings that I've had and from the work that I do. They're very media sensitive. So the, the person who runs the agency loves to tweet about things that she's doing and things that she's done. So if I was being underpaid, I would tweet her, quite frankly. That's probably what I would do because there seems to be a lot of focus on Twitter. And um, if, if I wasn't going to get any results from phoning in or, or um, writing in, I would probably start taking photos of what's going on, taking photos of my pay slips and, you know, get little films made of what's happening and tweet them and tweet the, the person who runs the... Let, let me just go back to our question. Hamza, what do you think about that as a potential solution? Um, the solution is in your hands, that is to say in the hands of the workers to somehow document their own cases. Is it uh, allowed legally to take a picture or fo photo or video uh, to report that? Yes, it's yes. Mm. Yes, it's your payslip. If an employer gives you your payslip, it's your payslip, that's your property. And, um, you know, th there's no excuse for people being underpaid. There is just no excuse. It should not happen. It do I know it does happen and there is a black market out there that's real and there's a cash economy out there and that is real and they are things that shouldn't happen but they do and they are worse in some sections of the economy more than others and it's not too difficult to work out for yourself which industries and which section sections of the community are underpaid. If you go to a restaurant and, um, or you can just, I'm not going to say any more because I'll get accused of being horrible to certain communities, but, you know, there are some communities that just don't, that just ignore the laws. Um, so, I'm, I'm going yeah. to just go around the panel, Grace, now. And, uh, Rosie, you've actually worked um, in low-paid jobs from a very early age. How does it, I mean, you've listened to this question. I mean, does it ring true to you that this is happening? Uh, of course it does, yes. And um, I have, you know, the privilege of being white and um, not uh, an immigrant worker. Um, I uh, have worked in jobs where, you know, I, I, I would only get paid out of money that came out of the till and things like that. There's a lot of dodginess going on. Um, I think, though, uh, to tweet is not the solution. Um, I think, though, it shouldn't be on the workers to fix this problem. I think there's an actual cultural problem where business owners are respected more and their rights are respected more than those of workers. What I don't understand is if you can't afford to run your business unless you are underpaying your employees, then you can't really afford to run a business. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case um, today. Um, I, I think they get caught sooner or later. They do. They do. Get, do they? Yes, they do. Mm. Yeah, they do. They, they do. Let's hear they, from Jackie. They do. Let's hear from Jackie. Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's not um, something that's been brought up to me from Tasmania um, about a lot of this stuff going on. It seems to be more on the mainland. I mean, mm. if I got that wrong, I do apologise for Tasmanians, but it's not something in the three years that I was in my office that I ever had one constituent saying, I'm getting underpaid. So, and I think you're right. I think There's your answer, do... sir. Move to Tasmania. Everything will be solved. <laughs> I'm working on population growth. I'm doing my bit. <laughs> Uh, I just, um, it doesn't seem, I think since the 7-Eleven thing happened mm. and all that, mm. that people have been put on, you know, they've mm. put on their marching orders to uh, uh, get their crap together and stop ripping workers off or we're coming for you. Um, I didn't realise that about fair work and if they haven't got enough people up there, they should have more people up there. Um, you know, and you can go to Grace because she writes for the Australian. She'll get it out there for you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I will. I will write. Yes, you will it. too. I will. I don't Mark Dreyfus. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Um, Grace Collier and Donald Trump might think that attack by Twitter is the answer to this, but I actually don't. I think it's about enforcement, Hamza. I think that we need to have um, an actual culture in the regulatory agencies where they go out and enforce, not wait for it to appear in the media. Uh, we've, this is wage theft, and I was very pleased to see at the weekend the uh, Victorian. Uh, Labor, the State Labor Party announcing that they're taking a policy to the next election which is going to 
uh, put criminal penalties on people who underpay their workers deliberately and people who don't pay superannuation entitlements deliberately. Uh, I think at the Commonwealth level we need to look really, really hard at more enforcement so that we get a culture in this country where nobody thinks that they can get away with underpaying their workers and nobody thinks they can get away with not paying superannuation. It, it's actually a cultural thing and I regret to say to Jackie that <coughs> it's, it's happening in Tasmania. Mm. Sorry to deal with your population Thank you for that. Uh, we'll approach, that but uh, it's happening there too. Just very briefly, uh, the first part of that question was about the 3.5% uh, uh, increase in the minimum wage. Um, is that enough? No. No. Well, uh, it's, a, it's something that I was very pleased to see happen. Uh, Labor supported this increase uh, and made a submission in this process. Uh, the government didn't support this increase and uh, it's of course only the minimum wage. It deals with the very lowest of low paid workers. Uh, what we've got happening in this country at the moment is practically no wage growth at a time of rising corporate profits. And we do have to look hard at our entire enterprise bargaining system. We have to look hard at the way that the Fair Work Act is working and uh, make sure that there is some way in which those rising profits can actually be shared in the form <coughs> of some rises in wages. OK, Dan Tien. Well, I, I think it's wrong for Mark to say we didn't support this increase. What we didn't do was put a submission in. That's not support. No, no, it's, that's, that's not true, Mark. What, what that is is saying we've got an independent Fair Work Commission which you established, which has a job to do, and so we said get on and do your job, and that's what it did, and 3.5% was the increase that it's, it's um, come up with, and the government... Um, has said we will accept that because that is the independent Fair Work Commission that you, that you established. When it comes to your, the other point, um, everyone needs to obey the law and that, that needs to be clear. But I would say this, the majority of businesses do. Uh, the majority of businesses are good, hard-working people who put their necks on the line each day, are currently generating 1,100 jobs a day for our economy. And so we have to remember that the majority of businesses are doing the right thing, but those who aren't, we do need to um, take to task and, and to prosecute. And I must say, every dealing that I've had with the Fair Work Ombudsman, when issues have been raised with me and we've approached them, they have investigated and looked at it. So mm. I, I think they are doing their, doing their job. Um, obviously, you know... Oh, I think every, they are, every, but yeah. I, think I think they are doing their job. They absolutely are, and it's full of good people who want to do their best, but they are stretched. And the point that I was making, I'm not saying that Twitter is the answer, Mark, but the point that I was making is that where there has been media interest, they are more motivated to investigate more quickly because... There, there's been a media interest. If something's been, if something's been written about or is, is, is on, being talked about on social media, they instantly are alerted to it. Okay. And that's just reality. All right. Um, and I'll just quickly go back to uh, Jackie. Um, I heard you say a loud no when the question came up about whether 3.5% three, for... No, it's not. Interest. We're just not keeping up with the cost of living. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, there's, there's no argument about that and those... The gap between the richer and poor is widening. You know, while we're sitting down there and they're getting that, was it $19, give or take, that they're going to get extra a week and you're giving tax cuts to big companies up there that aren't even paying bloody tax. I don't know what you're cutting exactly. But, you know, when you're doing that and yet you can't give them 50 bucks to keep up the cost of living and even then it's below, um, I just don't understand where you're going to be able to catch up in the next 10 years unless you get them up to where they are now. And age pensioners are even worse. I mean, you've got two-thirds of them living on or below the poverty line. How is that helping the country? How is that helping the health system? How is that helping the mental health system? For goodness sake, how is that helping the local store down the corner where they're relying on the aged pensioners and those people on those lower incomes to go down there and spend that little bit of money they've got to keep their doors open? You know, that's trickle-down economics. So we do a trickle-up. We don't rely on the big boys. We just trickle it back up to you blokes because that's how it works. OK, thank you very much. We move on to our next question. We're going to get through still quite a few questions from Robin Kirby, our next question. Go ahead, Robin. Uh, thanks, Tony. Um, has the Royal Commission into Institutional Child Abuse, coupled with the National Redress Scheme, now ostracised people who suffered at the hands of family and people outside of these institutions? In the state of Victoria, people can be awarded up to $7,500 as victims of crime which is well short of the 150000 maximum amount awarded to those that suffered at the hands of somebody who belonged to an institution. Dan Tien. 
Uh, well, obviously, in setting up the National Redress Scheme, uh, we um, followed that from the Royal Commission into child sex abuse. And so we had to do it within the parameters of, of the Royal Commission. So the Royal Commission didn't deal with uh, uh, abuse everywhere. It dealt specifically with child sexual abuse. And that's the parameters under which we had to set up the National Redress Scheme. A and that's what we did. And that's what every state and territory government has come on board with of, of all political persuasions. Uh, now we have um, the, a clear majority of the non-government institutions uh, coming on board as well. We've still got more work to do in that regard. But what we've done is implement, uh, as best we can, uh, the recommendations on national redress as set out by, by the Royal Commission. Just to pick up the question at this point, should there be a broad scheme for all uh, sexual abuse victims, whether no, that happens in an institution? It's actually physical abuse, Tony. Yeah. Physical abuse. That the question goes to physical abuse, which is not dealt, was not dealt with by the Royal Commission. That's what the question's about. Is that, let's go back to Robin, is it, are you talking purely about physical abuse? or oh, physical? physical and sexual abuse, you know, the, there's inequality there on the amount of uh, payout that's available from 7,500 to 150,000, so is uh, the abuse suffered by, um, uh, that was perpetrated by family members, is that less than institutional abuse? Yeah. Do you mind if I say something? That's the same with the veterans. Theirs was capped at 50,000, so I had 15-year-olds going through, um, you know, through, through traineeships and apprenticeship schemes, uh, and they, their lives have been ruined. But I'll tell you what, theirs was capped at 50,000, so there is inequality going on here, and somebody needs, somebody needs to set a standard amount for any sort of abuse that's going on. As for the institutions, I can tell you what, it's taken them long enough to come up and, be, and, and at least say to these people, first of all, their apology was way too long. They just sat there as if nothing was happening. And then they're still out there crying because they've got to sell some of their churches up or whatever. Well, you know what? Suck it up. It is your fault these people are living in the nightmares they're living. So if it means you've got to sell some of that property off, then you have to because you have to pay for your sins. Somebody please tell the Catholic Church that. Rosie, I'm going to bring, bring it back to you because um, you've had your own personal um, experiences, personal stories. Um, about things happening within families. So could, could you want to address that question as well? Yeah, um, I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, I was sexually abused in foster care, but then you can't forget that I was in foster care in the first place because my home life was also abusive and neglectful. Um, I don't think that the abuse and neglect that I suffered at home or um, in the foster care system, or my sisters suffered in the foster care system, I don't think they should be measured differently. Um, abuse of children is abuse of children. I don't think we do enough to handle it across the board, whether it be privately at home or in institutions. I think the redress scheme is a good step forward. Uh, what worries me, though, is that we're not doing enough uh, to prevent this from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. The fact that we need to legislate a scheme to allow compensation for victims of child sexual abuse to be a smoother uh, process means that it's happening way too much to begin with. I, I appreciate that we need to um, look back on the trauma and apologise for the trauma and address the, tra address the trauma that has occurred. But we also need to look at how we can stop that trauma from occurring in the first place. Um, you know, I don't have answers as to how to solve that. I will say that I think um, mental health care in this country needs a serious boost because anybody who's been through any kind of childhood trauma desperately needs mental health treatment in order to deal with that. I've had PTSD since I was 17 years old. I've been in and out of the mental health system. Um, and I, my sisters are the same. And if that sort of thing was covered by an adequate mental health system, I think a lot of people would be able to survive into adulthood uh, a lot better than what they do now. Um, Dan, can you respond to that? I mean, obviously, you can have a redress scheme here that's quite generous because the institutions themselves have to cough up. Um, as Jackie was saying, whether it's the churches or whatever, but is it the responsibility of governments or someone else to deal 
with compensation for equally egregious acts that happen within families? Well, it's, it's just not institutions, Tony. It's governments as well mm. um, who, are, who are part of the, the sure. redress scheme yep. a, as well. Um, and to go to Rosie's point, the Royal Commission also handed down a lot more recommendations than just the National Redress Scheme to deal with this issue. And the, the government is systematically working through all those recommendations as well because I think all of us um, on this panel, in this audience, no one wants to see children abuse, whether it's physical, whether it be sexual, be it any kind. And, you Nor know, another Royal Commission uh, uh, down the track that says, we never dealt with this issue. The, the, this issue. So, I, I mean, you know, from state government, territory government, federal government, I know, you know, this is bipartisan. You know, we want to do everything we can to, to stop this occurring and, and, and stop this happening. And uh, if we can do that, if people have got suggestions or ideas um, on what we, what we need to do, we're all ears. More because, money. Um, more money, more resources. Uh, and there is more money and more resources going into mental health. We've got to make sure, though, that it continues to be targeted and gets the outcomes that, that we want. Um, and, okay. you know, I'm sorry, we I'm going to catch you off only here because we've got can, other questions. I hear from Mark Dreyfus. Um, I wish we had more time. Robin's question was about the inequity mm. of children who suffered in institutions physical abuse that didn't have a sexual component being left out. And uh, Dan Tehan, as Minister... Well, I think he explained it was actually yeah. both things well, happening within well, families. And also sexual abuse that's happened within families. Um, I had some small part in setting up the Royal Commission into <laughs> child sexual abuse in institutions. It was a narrow focus at one level. But it uncovered, it, it heard testimonies from 8,000 survivors. There are tens upon tens of thousands of cases expected to come forward and make a claim on this redress scheme, which is going to be set up on the 1st of July, and that's a good thing. Uh, the, the state governments and institutions who've joined will now already cover, I think, 90% uh, of the people that are eligible. But it's mm. thrown up, and your question focuses on this, that there are other people who've suffered equally dreadful abuse, either sexual abuse outside institutions or physical abuse inside institutions. I think going forward a lot of the recommendations of the magnificent work of this Royal Commission will be applicable, to pick up Rosie's point, to prevent this sort of um, dreadful things happening in future. Uh, and we are going to have to look at uh, the compensation or redress issues um, because it's sharply apparent to me, it's sharply apparent to you and to many other people looking at this that uh, we've set up a useful redress scheme that can avoid people going to court because that's the alternative. You I'm, just to gonna, I'm sorry to yeah. cut you off here, but um, are you actually saying that a Labor government would uh, look at putting much more money into such a scheme to encompass uh, not a broader I'm not definition I'm of abuse? I'm not committing, Tony, to no. more money here okay. now, but it, it's, I'm saying it's, it's, it's something that's been repeatedly said through the course of the five years of this Royal Commission. What about people who suffered as a, a, as a child, either from beatings uh, in institutions or from sexual abuse outside institutions, yeah. and it's on the table. We, it, it's, and I know Dan is thinking about okay. it too, because it is repeatedly raised right, with I'm told we have to go to our last question, yeah. because that's all we have time for. Um, our last question is from Maria Rodriguez. Hi. Um, Roseanne Barr's comments that stirred up controversy last week were racist and harmful, um, but her show offered an example of how families divided by political hostilities could engage with issues that are important to them um, and opening a door perhaps for progress. Was cancelling the show the best way of demonstrating that racism is unacceptable or will it simply feed into the narrative that white Americans are being abused by the political correctness police? Grace Collier, I'll start with you. Ah, thank you. Um, look, I haven't seen the show but um, People are more important than politics, and I think that if that's what it was about, if it was about people in families and with different politics getting on, then that's an important message. In terms of the political correctness, I am one of those people that political correctness annoys me. I admit that. I find it very difficult to keep up with what you are allowed to say and what you are not allowed to say. And... Um, Let's, well, let's, let Roseanne Barr's tweet said this, Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes had a baby 
equals the yeah. J. She was referring to uh, Barack Obama's former advisor, Valerie Jarrett, who's an yeah. African-American. So yeah. essentially she was equating... Yeah. A black woman with... With an ape, yeah. yeah. So it's a very mean, stupid thing to say and very racist and people say mean, stupid things. Since that was said, all I've seen on Twitter is people tweeting back and forth about, oh, well, this person on our side of the fence said... or this person on your side of the fence said this and then the other people will tweet back and say, well, your person said this. And so there's this competition between the two sides of politics about whose side says the worst stupid things and whether the punishments were equal and so on and so forth. It's very tedious um, and very pedestrian. Can I just I think... quickly go back to Maria and our question? Yeah. Maria, I think you're an American originally. Um, yeah. What was your view of what Roseanne Barr actually said in that tweet? Did that deserve a sacking or not? She was sacked by ABC precisely I think it for what she said. it serious reproach. I think it was horrid. And I don't think it was uh, a little faux pas. I think it was um, racist and mm -hmm. it was horrible. I'm just not sure that responding to it by stopping that particular show was necessarily the best move because it seems that she put together a comedy that had a family talking about these issues that a lot of American families are having to sweep under the carpet and not talk about because um, they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. Okay, I'm, we, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering I'm, whether yeah. they could have I'm dealt gonna, with it in a way that aired aired I'm, her. I'm going to throw that around the, the show. Throw that around the panel to talk about, papers. and uh, I'll come back yeah. to you, Grace, um, Rosie. Uh, Roseanne Barr is not the only uh, comedian and writer who can create a show like that. Um, and I think that cancelling the show sent the kind of major message that was needed, that we're not going to put up with racism and language like that anymore. I know people have been arguing about her right for free speech, um, and I think, you know what, if you have a right to say that, then I have a right to call you an asshole. Um, and that's by cancelling the show, that's what they did. I, um have a nephew, he's five years old, he's called Muhammad. I have a niece, she's one year old, she's called Aya. They're both being raised as Muslims and I want them to grow up in a world where someone tweets something like that and they aren't allowed to get away with it and cancelling that show was the big message they needed to send and I'm glad that they did it. Jackie Lambie. Yeah, trouble is when you do that to everybody else around that lost their jobs at this point in time so that, mm. that's a bit of a problem. She did step over the line but Apparently she had too much still knocks. So, no, I don't know whether she did or not. Maybe she didn't take a happy pills that morning, but it was really bad in what she said. Um, you get a lot of that on social media. It's just really mean-spirited stuff, and it is really awful, and I can see why people uh, end up with suicide, doing suicide, because it is really awful stuff that they're putting on social media. Trouble is these days. So if someone just put a tweet out or a, a tweet out or a Facebook thing out, but they wouldn't dare stand in front of your face and have the guts to say what they're saying on social media. And this is a massive problem out there and they're getting away with it. So it goes way beyond um, Roseanne Barr, what's going on. Why ABC would put that show on is beyond me. I mean, they might have sort of put Charlie Sheen and Two and a Half Men back on. Because really, it's just not ABC, up ABC's alley. No, uh, we're, so we're talking ABC in probably. America. Yeah, I realise that, but it's still not... It's up there, it also right? wasn't one tweet. I think we need to remember that. This wasn't, this wasn't the first... She's been tweeting things like this for years. So it, it just wasn't just because really. of this single tweet. Mm. Uh, Dan, mm. uh, Well, what, what she wrote in that tweet um, was abhorrent and there's no excuse for it. Um, I think it's very much up to the, the news channel themselves to decide whether the show should go on or not, and they took the decision not to. Um, I think the point that there could be other shows of a, of a similar real or build something on that can, can fill its place if, if people see a market market's there. But if, if they thought that the show could go on, then they would have the right, obviously, to make that, that decision as well. But they've taken the decision not to continue with it, and uh, I, I think we've, you know, that, that's perfectly We're pretty their much right out of time. Doing. I'm just going to go back to our question because she uh, wanted to get back involved in oh, I was just going to sort of come back on um, this issue of whether anybody can make a show like hers because I think, to me, she um, engaged in, engages Trump supporters to watch a show and I'm not so sure that... I, I think she gets a lot of people to think about issues because this, this series was supposed to be about debating these issues and I think um, it's hard to get 
staunch Trump supporters to engage with those issues if why they don't have pan, someone who they trust the as... Why should we pander to them? I'm not interested in pandering to them. I want to get angry with them. I don't think they deserve a show. I want, to get, angry. I want to get angry with them too. I, I want to get angry they, with them on air. They don't deserve their own show just because they're racist and they refuse to watch anything else. Okay, I, want, uh, I want to uh, air the argument. With, with, that, with that little exchange, and thank you for your comment, um, we'll have to leave it because we've run out of time. Please thank our panel. Jackie Lambie, Dan Tian, <laughs> Rosie Wardlin, Grace Collier and Mark Dreyfus. And thank you very much to our very lively Melbourne audience. You can continue the discussion with Q&A Extra on News Radio and Facebook Live, where Scott Wales is joined by author Jane Carrow. Now, next Monday, Q&A will be live from the Adelaide suburb of Elizabeth, uh, when opposition leader Bill Shorten will face your questions. The Turnbull government has consistently targeted Mr Shorten's character and his union past, and while Labor leads in the polls, the opposition leader still lags behind his preferred Prime Minister. So is Kill Bill hitting the mark. Next Monday, Australian voters will have their chance to test Bill Shorten when he faces your questions on Q&A. And, of course, we've asked Mr Turnbull to join us as soon as possible. Until next week, good night.